Your doctor probably believes a lot of outdated information about the body. Dogma that never really had any real evidence behind it, let alone proof, but which they tend to hold as absolute truth. A good example is the supposed impossibility of growing nerves, neurons, or cardiac muscle cells. They still taught this back when I was in school, but to make a long story short, we did not know about stem cells until relatively recently, and we didn't know how effective they could be in repairing the body until even more recently. If you believe you can't get better, you won't get better, because you won't try. Many people have been told they would never walk again by doctors, and managed to make it happen anyway. Many more have just given up and gotten used to never walking again. Even if this outdated idea were true, we do know people sometimes have remarkable recoveries from traumatic brain injury and from even very severe heart failure. There are also other mechanisms such as cardiac cells taking on more mitochondria to become stronger which can also happen in other muscle over time to make a slow twitch muscle into a faster twitch muscle. Some cells in the brain can also gain more mitochondria and take up the slack when there's not enough neurons around by doing some of their work too. Thankfully though, there are also stem cells and they are probably the most effective means by which our organs can repair themselves. Not only can the stem cells in the heart replace damaged muscle cells, but so can the ones in the bone marrow. Which is very interesting because these mesenchymal stem cells are released during extended fasts, and they can go anywhere in the body. In fact, anything that switches these cells towards oxidative phosphorylation will do the same thing, such as phototherapy or even simple vinegar. And it's important to note that neutralized vinegar will have the same effect as acidic vinegar since the high acidity can be very damaging. So you could neutralize it with potassium bicarbonate and not have to worry about excessive acidity. Your macrophages can also lend mitochondria to cells in your organs or consume plaques in arteries or in the brain itself, but this will only happen when they are switched into an oxidative phosphorylation state which is the body's natural repair state that typically happens only when fasting, but can also be encouraged in other ways. As I said, this switch of glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation is important for two reasons. One is that stem cells are activated. Stem cells in their hypoxic niche carry out glycolysis. But when the mitochondria are activated, they need oxygen, so they have to get out of their niche and they can undergo proliferation and differentiation programs. The second effect of this glycolysis to oxphos switch is anti-inflammatory. So macrophages have an M1 phenotype and a pro-inflammatory carry out glycolysis. When oxphos is activated, they switch to the M2 anti-inflammatory phenotype. And if these happen to be microglia in the brain, they can undergo phagocytosis, for instance, disposing of amyloid plaque that clogs up the brain. Dr. Hamlin from the clip is the premier researcher in phototherapy, and in the future, this will be a much bigger part of injury recovery. You will get treatment on the battlefield or in the ambulance with phototherapy before they even get you to the hospital, and in some cases, even while you're in cardiac arrest. Thankfully, you don't have to wait for the hospitals to catch up with science. You can do this at home to hasten along recovery from brain trauma or other injury. A couple years back, I had some wind burn on my face that just wouldn't heal because it kept getting re-aggravated. I put it under the red light one night before bed, and to my amazement, it was completely gone in the morning. While the theory behind this stuff is very promising, the practical results really amaze me and always exceed my expectations. And that's why even though I might sound like a broken record, I just keep mentioning it over and over again. You may also have heard about decalcifying your pineal gland to restore your ability to dream regularly. Well, this is something I have found with both fasting and phototherapy. 
Which makes sense because they both encourage phagocytosis, which is the only process your body has to remove plaque. I seldom had dreams before, but now I always do. Especially if I do a little phototherapy on my face or the top of my head right before bed. Before I go on, I should also address some other outdated information out there. In some Alzheimer's studies, they found that autophagy did seem to be increased with water fasting, yet the removal of protein aggregates like beta amyloid and other problematic components within the cells was not affected. So the cells were shooting blanks. It's possible some key mechanisms that influence autophagy to eliminate these components may be inhibited or some other reason, but ultimately it did not seem to have an effect. This, of course, doesn't mean fasting isn't effective, but it leans toward it not being effective through autophagy. First off, it is important to realize autophagy is entirely within the cell, including macro autophagy. The naming confuses a lot of people, but the fact is phagocytosis can remove extracellular plaques, but nothing else can. And the clip I played previously explains how fasting and phototherapy can help activate this. It's also now been shown that these plaque levels simply don't matter much. And many people exist who have huge amounts of this plaque and are totally healthy. There are also many who have severe Alzheimer's who have insignificant levels of plaque. There's even been plaque reducing medications developed and they did nothing at all to improve Alzheimer's symptoms. For three decades, we've had this amyloid cascade theory and other theories such as the tau theory that regard Alzheimer's as a disease caused by these neurotoxic proteins. And I'm going to show you why I think um, neurodegeneration is kind of like, has a, is grounded uh, in a similar origin as cancer, except it's just in a different tissue type. A lot of people know, don't actually think why neurons don't become cancerous, but uh, it's very, very rare that they do. So the amyloid cascade theory basically starts out, says you start out with a normal neuron, you get these abnormal proteins inside the neuron, you get abnormal proteins interfering with neuron function, and then you get neurodegeneration, neuron loss, and dementia. And again, there are several inconsistencies. I'll just mention a couple of them this time uh, for time reasons. So the first, of course, is that there's rampant mitochondrial dysfunction in these Alzheimer's neurons. And uh, they precede the plaques and tangles. The Alzheimer's neurons show reduced mitochondrial numbers, abnormal shapes. Some of them are too long and skinny. Some of them, some of them are too small and round. They should be like ellipsoid, nice bean-shaped uh, things. They have population dynamics all messed up and so on. So they're very dysfunctional. So again, normal mitochondria on the left. The Alzheimer's ones, uh, some of them are too circular. The cristae are really not well formed and um, th there's issues there. Second thing is this plaque deposition paradox. If the amyloid cascade theory is correct and plaques cause Alzheimer's, then basically, you know, you should have a plaque load that correlates with the degree of the neuron loss and certainly the clinical symptoms. And that doesn't really happen. So you've got the neurons there with these um, amyloid plaques sitting around them. And, you know, basically there's a lot of people who uh, age normally and have no dementia that have quite high plaque loads. And then there's a, a lot of people who have Alzheimer's who have few or no plaques. So the correlation really isn't there to make that statement. So here's a mitochondrial theory of Alzheimer's. So again, you start out with a normal neuromitochondria exposed to various insults, air pollution, and so on. Over years and decades, the damage accumulates and you get mitochondrial dysfunction. And then the neuron faces an energy shortage, but neurons can't use the Warburg effect because they don't have the glycolytic machinery to do it. So unlike most cells that can utilize the Warburg effect and hog a lot of glucose to compensate for their damaged mitochondria, neurons can't do that. So they tend to wither and die. And uh, as they're doing that, uh, you know, a lot of their normal metabolic functions go awry. These proteins accumulate that perhaps normally would have been removed and you get neurodegeneration but it's a response the protein buildup is a response to the cause which is the mitochondrial dysfunction so targeting the proteins is not gonna not gonna help in any significant way and that's where you get your neurodegeneration on the other hand it's been shown that a low carb diet can reverse early Alzheimer's and cut Parkinson's symptoms almost in half Basically, when you have Alzheimer's, you have brain cell insulin resistance. The mitochondria just don't work right, 
and they can't use glucose as fuel till this goes down. But it can still use ketones for fuel. While you can't assume the exact same result, since the mechanisms are largely the same, except they're activated to a higher degree, most likely fasting or a fasting mimicking diet is going to have even better results than a keto diet. In fact, you also get neuronal growth from fasting itself, which is much more than a low-carb diet could ever do. For many years, it was unquestionable dogma that neurons and even simple nerve cells could never regrow, but that has been shattered in recent years. Fasting increases nerve growth factor and brain-derived neurotrophin factor, which can stimulate nerve and neuron growth in the hippocampus. Now you might discount this because the hippocampus is just one part of the brain, but it is a little known fact that virtually all neurons in the brain are created in the hippocampus. From there they migrate to other areas of the brain or even to the heart or other places as needed. This makes sense when you realize it's the hippocampus that encodes memories and that your memories are stored holographically throughout all the neurons in your brain. To grossly simplify, every neuron has to have most of the same information inside of it as every other neuron, or your brain just doesn't work properly. Fasting mimicking diets also seem to be surprisingly beneficial even compared to water fasting, so this seems to be a viable option for those who are unable to do true fasts at all, or if you want to do a level of fasting that's simply impractical to do every single week, like three or four days or even five days of fasting. The traditional sick bed food of broth truly seems to be the optimal diet for those recovering from illness or injury. Another important thing for healing the brain are the building blocks themselves. EPA and DHA are very important, but another factor for cell membranes in new cells is phosphatidylserine. Unfortunately, only the animal source version seems to be effective, but on the bright side is it abundant in many places that EPA and DHA are also abundant, particularly in mackerel and herring. So coming back to the original question of what would I do if I had a traumatic brain injury, the answer is I would do all the same things I already do, but even more of it. Some extended fasting if I can manage it, and if not, then a fasting mimicking diet for three to five days in a row every week. Then I'd break the fast with sardines, mackerel, or herring for the brain building blocks. I'd do phototherapy daily, especially in the cranial area. Neutralize vinegar to stimulate oxfos pathway that leads to healing. Supplements like niacin, inamin, and olive oil to stimulate intracellular repair. Methylene blue to improve mitochondrial health. And I'd of course avoid high insulin foods and try and eat as cleanly as possible. A low carb diet will also trigger oxfos and improve mitochondrial health to a lesser degree though. You could probably do several days of broth only fasting mimicking diet followed by several days of healthy eating pretty much for the rest of your life if you had to. And if I had a traumatic brain injury or a stroke, then I would definitely try to do it as much as humanly possible.